We're going to begin in verse 22. We're going to wrap up the uh, book of Galatians today. The title of our message is Sowing to the Spirit. If you want to follow along the sermon notes on your smartphone or your tablet, you're welcome to do that. You're going to need the church app. So just do an app search for Calvary Hillsborough. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for life. We open our hearts this morning to receive and pray that you would just minister now by your Holy Spirit and just move upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is bringing this letter to a grand conclusion with these verses. And I, and I look back on this book, and I, I really appreciate it. It's one of the richest, deepest, most practical books because it really speaks to the very important understanding of how a believer can have victory in his walk, a victory over the flesh. Now, let's, let's go back a little bit and understand why he wrote the letter. He wrote because there were these teachers that had come from Jerusalem that were uh, disrupting the church. And uh, not just these churches in Galatia, but others as well. And they were trying to uh, convince these, uh, these believers that if they wanted to be true followers of Christ, then they needed to really take on Judaism. They needed to come under the law, and <clears throat> especially that they needed to be circumcised as an outward sign of it. So Paul is just hot. He's just absolutely hot about this because this is not the gospel. <clears throat> this is not the heart of God. And if you'll pardon the expression, he wants to cut them off and literally bring the church to be in a place of health and spiritual maturity. And so he gives some of the greatest insights into the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, going back just a bit, we have to ask the question, well, why did God give the law at all? In fact, he, he, he addresses this in chapter 3. If God knew that no one could live by the standards of that law, then why in the world did God even get it? And he gives the answer, because of transgressions. He knew the tendency of the flesh. He knew that, that the tendency of the flesh was to desire those things which are very worldly, and so he gave the law to constrain, to restrain, he said. But it was like, a, like an authoritarian, bossy guardian. And it was never meant to be permanent. In fact, he said that it was only until the time, the fullness of time came when God sent forth his son, that we would be set free. You see, there's no relationship in a bossy authoritarian guardian. And so he says, we've been set free from that so that we can have relationship to God as our Abba, Father. We've been set free. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. Abba, beautiful relationship. But then we have to ask this question. Well, if we've been set free from the law, we're no longer under that bossy authoritarian guardian, then what about the flesh? What about those transgressions? I mean, did God set us free so that we could be free-range chickens? Did he set us free so our flesh could go hog wild without any constraints? Paul gives answers that are very, very powerful here, and he lays down a foundation in the verses that we were looking at recently. For example, in verse 13, he said, You were called to freedom, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Verse 16, I say this, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Oh, he's speaking to it, all right. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible there. Verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So he tells us the key. The key to victory is the Holy Spirit. He said, now God set us free so we could be adopted as a son or a daughter. If you've been adopted, then you have a father. And if you have a father, you have an authority. That's the, the picture of a father is an authority over your life. But you're in a family. You have a relationship of love. There's the beautiful, wonderful blessings that come in that being adopted. Now, we love that picture. It means a lot to us personally. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. We adopted, you know, as you, uh, as you know, the two boys from Russia. We've, 
adopted our granddaughter now. But the two boys from Russia were such a picture of, of what we're saying because they were true orphans. Father was murdered. Their mother died from cancer. They had no family. They had no future. They had no hope. We adopted them. They have a family. They have love. They have relationship. They have a future. They have a new name. They have hope. They have a father. Beautiful, powerful picture. God set us free so we could be adopted. And then he said, And then I sent forth the Spirit of my Son into your hearts. What a picture. The Holy Spirit is given to every person when they receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Spirit ignites our heart. The Holy Spirit transforms our lives. See, the Holy Spirit gives us the desires that are very, very different than the desires of the flesh. The Spirit hungers, longs for, thirsts after things which are good, right, beautiful, honorable, godly. It's like, I want those things. You see, that's where the conflict is. There's a conflict. Everybody knows there's a conflict because we still all have the flesh. And the urgings, the passions of the flesh are very much opposed to the things of the Spirit. So he says, we have a choice. There is a choosing. And it has everything to do with what we want our lives to become. So he lays this out in these verses beginning in verse 22. We start there. Notice, though, he just finished speaking about what the deeds of the flesh are. We don't really need a lot of instruction on that one. We know that one pretty well. But he tells us in verse 22 that the fruit of the Spirit, the result of the Spirit of the living God in our lives is this, love. What a beautiful thing. I would love to have that kind of love alive, he says. Joy. The joy, not like the world gives, Jesus says, the joy that I give is a joy everlasting. Peace, peace that passes understanding. Patience. Oh, we need patience. That's of God, he says. Kindness, that's of God. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, uh, there is no law. Law doesn't speak to these things. This is the move of the Holy Spirit. Then he, verse 24 those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh along with its passions and its desires. Hey, if we live by the Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if, even if a man is caught in any trespass or overtaken by a trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. We have a relationship to one another, to encourage, to lift up, to bless and edify. Each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted, bearing one another's burdens, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Did Christ give a law? Yes. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And in so doing, the world will know that you're my disciples when they see the love that you have for one another. So he goes on to say, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own life, his own work. You see, we're each one responsible for our own faith. You can't rely, you cannot rest on the faith of your wife, or your husband, or your parents. Each one has his own faith. So then he will have reason for boasting or glorying in regard to himself, not in regard to another, for each one bears his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. And then verse 7 and following, very powerful verses. I quote these often. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That which a man sows, this he will also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap life, even eternal life. 
Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. He adds a personal note. He had very bad eyesight, so he writes with large letters. Let's go back over this, starting in verse 22 of chapter 5. The principles here are so key, so important, so practical. And he begins by helping us to see that the Spirit brings spiritual fruit. He gives the list here, you see, of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm convinced that he gives us this list so that we can look at this list and say, delicious, I want that. That's good. I mean, love, I want that in my life. Joy, man, I would love to have joy. I want that. Peace, I, I so want. Peace, patience, I need patience. I want that. What a wonderful list. These are things that I really, really desire. And he uses the word fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I'm convinced he uses that word because fruit is good. Fruit is sweet. Fruit is tasty. It's like Oregon strawberries. Like, oh, how juicy, how delectable, how delightful, how refreshing. Notice he doesn't say the vegetables of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say the broccoli of the Holy Spirit. He's giving us this picture so that we want it, so that we go, oh, that's good. Oh, that's juicy. That is sweet. See, we have a choice. He wrote these words so that we would understand. See, fruit is tasty. It's refreshing. It's nutritious. It's good for you. In contrast, there's Fruit Loops. Now, I realize that Fruit Loops are magically delicious. But what exactly is in Fruit Loops? I'm glad you asked. Let's look, shall we? Let's see. Notice, by the way, they don't, they don't even spell it right. You know why? There's no fruit in Fruit Loops. What is in Fruit Loops? First thing. Sugar. Number one thing is sugar. But let's not forget some of the other ingredients. There's, of course, red number 40. That sounds really healthy. Blue number two. There's turmeric color. There's yellow number six. There's blue number one. And don't forget, there's BHT for freshness. You know what BHT is? It's some long word and they make tires out of it. It can't be good. That's an interesting thing. What a picture for us. We see the difference, the contrast. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruits of the flesh. If you've been around this world long enough, I think you can add your own testimony at this point. Because I think there's a lot of people in this room who could say, oh, I know something about the flesh. I, I've lived enough on this world. I know something about the flesh. I'll tell you this. It, 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 it wants short-term pleasure, but it brings long-term pain. I'll, I'll tell you something about the flesh. I think there's a lot of people who could add their own testimony who would say, man, if I could see something to young people, it would be, please know this. Please know this. Because I've been there, and I can add my word to it. See, Romans 6, 21. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. That verse had a great impact on me when I was very young. I was like 21 or so, and really, in many ways, in, in the heat of that conflict between flesh and spirit. And someone had challenged me to memorize Romans 6. So, I took on that challenge, and I was doing that. And so as I'm going through, now that's verse 21, so you're like well into the chapter. And I'm going through, and I'm, I'm repeating the verse, repeating. That's how you memorize. You repeat, and you repeat. You start writing it on your heart. And as, as I repeated it several times, when you repeat a verse enough, it starts to kind of look. It starts to turn a little. You begin to see it from a different perspective, and as I began to repeat those words, it started to hit me really hard because it was so poignantly accurate. What benefit did you gain 
You're right, Lord. There was no benefit to that. From the things of which you are now ashamed, Lord, I am ashamed. You're right. And the outcome of those things is death. Lord, I see it. I see it now. I see it now. See, in, in Galatians 5, he's laying this out for us so that we can say, I want, I want the things of the spirit of life. I want the things that are good and godly and honorable and beautiful. And what is he showing us but that the spirit draws you to God. This is, this is the thing we need to see. It's because of the relationship. He draws you to God. See, the list of the fruit of the Spirit describes the nature of God's character. What's God like? What is his character? What is his nature? It's right here. Now, the Jews for many years considered that the law defined God. The, the law defined his character, his holiness, his righteousness. I suggest to you, though, that these verses here give us a much deeper, richer, a great higher understanding of who God is and his nature and his character. Many years ago, I used to teach a class called What a Christian Believes, kind of going through the tenets of the faith, you know, one upon the other. And we get to uh, who is God. And uh, in that class, I would, of course, bring out the, the fact that God is holy. So then I would say, well, can someone define holiness? Would someone like to try to divine holiness? Some people would raise their hands and I would say, okay. And the person, invariably, someone would say, well, holiness is the absence of sin. To which then I would say, well, we should be able to define holiness without contrasting it to sin. After all, holiness has been around a lot longer than sin has. It should be able to stand on its own. Let's define sin. Excuse me. Let's define holiness without contrasting it to sin. Answer, holiness is the character of God. God is holy, and his character, his nature, is defined for us right here. The fruit of the Spirit is love. This is the Spirit of the living God, and the nature of the results of his moving in our lives are seen. The Spirit is love. God is love. And the Spirit draws us to love. See, draw near to love, and you will be more loving. The Spirit draws us to God, and the closer you become to God, the more you begin to see his character moving in you. God is love. You draw near to love, and you'll be more loving. You draw near to joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit. My joy I give to you, Jesus, is not like the world. My joy. You draw near to joy and you will find your heart beginning to move with joy. Peace. You draw nearer to he who is our peace and you will find peace beginning to move in your life. God is patient. You begin to move nearer to God and the transformation of that heart is that you're seeing patience beginning to increase because you're drawing near to him who is patient. James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Notice that Paul begins by saying, the fruit of the Spirit is love. See, this is the Greek word agape love. Beautiful word. There's different words for love in the Greek. But this is the kind of love that is concerned for the good of the other one. In other words, it gives itself away. It sacrifices self for the good of the other. That's God's kind of love. In contrast... The deeds of the flesh are selfish, self-centered, self-focused. And you see the contrast of this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. There it is. Beautiful picture of what love is. Notice also that Paul finishes the list by saying the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Control of self comes from the Spirit of life. In other words, it's just like verse 16. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? It means that the, 
The Spirit is moving in your life. You're walking with the Spirit and your soul is alive. Your soul, your spirit is ignited. And that's what empowers you to say no to the flesh. Because your spirit is alive. And it's constraining the flesh. Why? Because in your spirit, you want something better. You want something more beautiful. You want that which is honorable. You desire to have character and integrity. Things of God you want. So then he says in verse 24, a very practical word, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. Here it is. Crucify the flesh, he says, along with its passions and its desires. So in other words, the passions of the flesh, we know what that is. The passions of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, they very much want to be the master. They want to control this whole deal. It wants what it wants, and it wants it now, and it expects you to cooperate. It wants to be the master. Here's a great verse, Romans 7, verse 5. While you were in the flesh, the sinful passions, here's his word again, but listen to the way he says it, because it's really interesting. The sinful passions which were aroused by the law. So was that a double entendre? No, that's on purpose. The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of your body to bear fruit for death. You want to talk about bearing fruit. There's the contrast. But how do you crucify the passions and the desires of the flesh? Is that even possible? Is that even reasonable? Is that even possible? How do you crucify? It means to... You know, nailed to the cross to bring death to it. How is that even possible? And one of the things that we really need to understand that he's pointing out and showing us here is that it takes a passion to kill a passion. This is a very, very important principle for the life of the believer. See, God made us to be alive. And passion for something is an expression of that. See, if a person comes to faith in Christ... And does not have passion, does not have a depth of love toward God. Then the passions of the flesh still have power. Because there's more passion for the flesh than there is passion for anything else. It still has power. It takes a passion to kill a passion. In other words, you cannot move from the passions of the flesh to boredom in Christ and expect that to work. God did not make us to be bored Christians. God did not save us so that we could be flatlined as a Christian. Jesus did not say, I'm going to give you salvation and board him along with it. I don't think that's what he said. What he said was, I have come that you have life and have it abundantly to the full. I want you to have life. I remember a guy that had come to faith in Christ in our church, and he was uh, living a life of drugs, honestly. And he'd come to Christ. God took hold of his heart. And I remember speaking to him and just being excited by how he was describing what God is doing in his life. And he said, you know, I don't know how to explain it other than, you know, I was addicted to drugs, and now I'm addicted to Christ. That's all I can say. There's something alive in me. He used to play guitar, you know, high, and, and, and he was like really into it and thought it made him more creative or whatever. But then he came to Christ, got addicted to Christ, and started using his guitar for the Lord and writing songs and playing, had a band, and he's using his passion for good and godly things. I'm excited about that. Now you get it because we have to have passion to kill a passion. You don't move from passion to boredom. Reminds me of when we were in Africa, and uh, we, had, we would give these, uh, you know, invitations for people to receive Christ hearing the gospel, and they would come and respond, and afterward, we would kind of draw them uh, to the side, and we would give each of them, after we prayed and talked with them, et cetera, we'd give them a Bible as a gift, and uh, it was really hard to, you know, get Bibles. It was very valuable, and we, would, we were outside giving these Bibles, and uh, after we'd given them, I began to look around and see that a crowd was gathering, 
large crowd was gathering and pressing in on us, and I thought, I think we should probably get in the vans now. So I start kind of moving the, the, our group, you know, into the vans, and uh, I was in the last vehicle, the Jeep, and we started to take off, and there was this guy who started to chase us. And he is running with all he's got down this block, up that block, down, and I'm kind of looking over my shoulder. And finally I said to the driver, stop this car. Anybody who wants a Bible that bad is getting a Bible. So we stopped the car, and I you know, go to the back where they are, and he's like, ah, ah. And I, I remember he handing the Bible to him in, the, in the, like a very proper you know, African way, and he takes it with both hands, and he goes, yes. What passion! Consider the extreme case of someone being set free from the power of a demon. What is the purpose of being set free from the power of the enemy if it isn't so that the, the spirit can fill and bring life? If someone is set free from the, from the power of the enemy and not filled with newness of life, their condition can end up being worse than at the beginning. Let me give you a verse. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. Now, he's describing the case of someone set free from a demon and then not receiving life. Notice, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and doesn't find it. So then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied. It wasn't filled with life. So then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. God made us to have life. We were made to have passion in how we live. God did not make us to be flatlined Christians. In John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, Jesus speaks again. And he says, now if anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Let's just pause there for a moment. That is a very powerful phrase. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It's a picture of the condition of the soul in the world. Thirsty. There's a condition in every person of emptiness. And there's a longing. There's longing and desiring, searching looking for, for that which to fill life and to have experience of, of, of intimacy and passion of life. We were made for that. And, and, and until we're understanding what it means to be filled with the life that God gives, people start looking to fill it in wrong ways. They're looking for passion in all the wrong places. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. And the end result of it is not good. The fruit of that is death, he says. And so he's giving us this picture in John 7. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. There will be like inside of you a, a, a well streaming up of life, living water. Joy abounding. You actually become one that can bless others because the joy of the Lord is flowing out and the love of God and the blessing, the edifying. Because you're like David, my cup overflows. You know, one of the lessons of parenting that we learned with our kids, I wish we would have learned it very early on. But one of those lessons is that kids need to be passionate about something for the Lord. If they are not passionate about something for the Lord, they'll start looking to fill that with all kinds of other things. Get them, get them started on a musical instrument, guitar or piano or something. Get them singing worship songs and excited about helping out in worship or, or giving them voice lessons, you know, and getting them singing and, and using that gift to help with worship and leading others and, or get them involved in serving in some way like a, a via goes and serves at the homeless shelter once a month or she goes to the, the senior center and blesses the seniors once a week. And I remember our, our two of our daughters, they served at, a, at an orphanage in Mexico, an orphanage for disabled uh, children 
and fell in love with those orphan kids. There's some passion that's coming out of them as they're in love with these, these kids. This is good. Uh, Victoria lived down there for like almost a year. That is awesome. Life-changing. We gave Avia uh, some CDs. Uh, a really great Christian artist, Jamie Grace, a young girl. And uh, she's just a great role model for young girls. And the great you know, CDs, and uh, so she's playing these, you know, loves to play them, and like, you know, can I play it in the room with all the speakers in it? Yeah, absolutely you can. Turn it up. I'm the dad. Turn it up. Let's do this thing, you know. So yesterday, we put it in there, turned it up. We were dancing. Like, hey, let's have some passion in life. God made us for passion. God made us for life. Otherwise, you'd be empty. And God did not make us to be empty. He says, now, in, in chapter 6, he explains something. You choose what you reap. What do you want your life to become? You, you can choose how you live. He gives what is famously known in these verses as the principle of the harvest. And he begins in verse 7 with those very strong words, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Now, people deceive themselves all the time mainly because they want to be. But when God is involved, deceiving oneself is quite dangerous. And then he says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Now what does it mean that God is not mocked? To mock God is to kind of scoff at what he says. (laughs) Yeah. You kind of look down with derision. Uh, It's like, you know, God's word is of no consequence. It's kind of like the modern way of saying, what, whatever. You know, God has principles of wisdom in life. Yeah, well, whatever. It's very, very disrespectful. God is not mocked, which means the principle stands whether you like it or not. That's what it means. The principle stands, whether you like it or not. It's a principle, it stands. It's a principle from God, it stands. What is that principle? Verse 7, whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Now, there's some details I think we can add to the principle. You reap after the manner that you sow. That's a detail we should understand. In other words, if you sow corn, you will reap corn. If you sow tomatoes, you will reap tomatoes. If you sow zucchini, you will reap a lot of zucchini. (laughs) Anybody ever raise zucchini, you know exactly what I'm saying. And uh, I remember, you know, we grew up in the country. And uh, we used to have a joke. See, because, you know, you don't really lock your cars uh, at least when I grew up, you didn't have to lock your cars or your doors, you know, when you lived out in the country, except during zucchini season. You had to lock your car during zucchini season, otherwise somebody might put a basket of zucchini into your car. That's how much you grow. So it's a great principle. But you also reap more than you sow. It's also a principle. Hosea 8, 7, they sow the wind, they will reap the whirlwind. And you sow, excuse me, you reap later than you sow. That's another important detail to it. Maybe we could make this personal, show of hands. How many people know this principle is true and would say, if I had known what it was going to cost me, I would not have done it. If I had known what it was going to cost me, I would not have done it. Because we know it's true. It's a principle. God's not mocked. The principle stands. That's why he says in verse 8, the one who sows to the flesh is going to reap from the flesh corruption. In other words, don't do it. Don't sow to the flesh. Now, as we said last week, the problem with the flesh is that it simply wants It lives only in the moment. It gives no thought to consequences. It gives no consideration to the results. It just wants. Me wants to, using a biblical illustration. 
Me want woman, using a modern one. So here, Paul says, there are consequences, though. Please know this. There are consequences when a person sows to the flesh. They will reap from the flesh, but what they will reap is corruption. And the word is death, stinking death. Now, notice also, the thing about sowing and reaping, as I said, is that when a seed is planted, the reaping does not come right away. And there is where many get deceived because they thought they got away with it. But the reaping does come. The principle stands. But there is something very important to understand. We need to add a layer of wisdom to this. Because while it is true that you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption, you can look forward and know that that is true. You can look forward. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh, and it will be corruption. You know, you can look forward. But looking backward requires a depth of wisdom and discernment. And here's why I say it. You cannot look at somebody's life and say, oh, I see that you're going through troubles. What kind of sin were you involved with there, my friend? No, otherwise you're becoming one of Job's counselors who took on the... the the thought that everything of trouble is originated from a sin. That's not always so. Not always so. Here's a case. Jesus and the disciples were walking by this man who was born blind. So the disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned that this man should be born blind? Was it him or his parents? No, they had already drawn the conclusion that someone had to have sinned. They just wanted to know who it was. Jesus said, neither. You're wrong. It's neither that this man sinned nor his parents sinned, but that the glory of God might be revealed through him. And he goes on to explain in great depth a wonderful principle. But now let's look at this. What do you do if you know that you are reaping from the flesh because you have sown to the flesh? What do you do? A number of years ago, a fellow came to the church, just looked us up randomly, and drove to the church, and I need, a, I need a pastor. I sat with him, what can I do for you? He begins to explain the troubles, oh, the troubles, the mountains of troubles that he had in his life. Now, he could very easily see that these troubles came because he had made very wrongful decisions. He could see it. I said to him, let me say something to you that's a very helpful and good word. He said, please, I need something. I said, what has happened is that you are living out the principle in Galatians 6. You have sown to the flesh, and now you are reaping from the flesh. These thorns and thistles and all these troubles have come. You planted those seeds, and now they have borne this. But I said, listen, though. The principle also works this way. You sow to the Spirit now, and you can stand on this promise. You will reap life. You've seen the principle at work, but I assure you now that if you will stand on this principle of sowing to the Spirit, you will, of the Spirit, reap life. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow. Stand now, and you will see. You can stand on this. God is not mocked. The principle stands. It's a good principle. It's a good principle because it contains a great promise. And I never forget. I asked him if he would pray. And he said, yes. And I said, I'm going to ask that you get on your knees with me. And he said, Okay. So we got down on our knees, and I remember we had these chairs we were leaning against, and I put my arm like this to hold myself up and one arm around him, and I said, please, you pray. And what came out of him was a beautiful, broken spirit. Beautiful, broken spirit. And I'll never forget, because my, my arm was getting wetted by his tears. And I thought of that verse, he holds our tears in a bottle because they are precious to the Lord. 
I thought, this is good. It's beautiful. Beautiful brokenness. Because it is now the spirit that's moving. I said, you are, you right now, you are planting. You are sowing. And good comes. You just keep doing that. You just keep standing in that. You can stand on this promise. See, here's the promise. Sow to the spirit and you'll reap life. Can I say something to everyone in this room this morning? Everyone in this room. You right now are sowing to the Spirit. Right now. You're sowing to the Spirit. Because the Word of God is going forth. And the Holy Spirit is taking the Word of God and is beginning to take hold of lives and is transforming lives. You right now are experiencing because you are, you are sowing to the Spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Now I am of little consequence in this. This is the Holy Spirit at work. He is moving on people's lives. You are sowing to the Spirit right now. And you will reap life. Verse by verse. Chapter by chapter. Day by day. Sow to the Spirit. And you can stand on this promise. You will reap life. Now, can you sow both to the flesh and the Spirit? Yes, you can. But one must overpower the other. And one will. And one will. Well, you might say, can, can the flesh choke out the things of the Spirit? Yes, they can. Let me give you a, a very clear verse. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Jesus is speaking about this parable of the sower sowing his seed. And uh, he said that the seed is like the word of God being sown on hearts. And there's different kind of hearts. So he says in verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. But as they go their way, they're choked with the worries and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And they bring no fruit to maturity. He uses the word. They choke out the, the word. And they bring no fruit. I mentioned before, we grew up on a farm and we uh, grew rows upon rows of vegetables and corn and potatoes and strawberries and we, ra we raised way too much of it, I know, because I had to hold the weeds. One day, someone had this idea. I know what let's do. Let's take chicken manure and we'll use it as fertilizer. Now, if you've ever been around the farm, you know this is a really bad idea. You know why it's a bad idea? Because chickens will eat every weed seed they can find. And weed seeds, they just go right through them. Guess what we were sowing? We were sowing weeds all over those vegetables. And when they came up, we had a battle on our hands. Do they grow up together? If you don't do anything, if you don't do anything, the weeds will overcome. Paul writes this so we can understand. We get to choose what we reap. What do you want your life to become? So a thought, reap an action. Reap an action, so a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. The weeds were everywhere. We wanted those things that were good. Get a hoe. Get a hoe, get a shovel. We're going to take them out. I want that which is good and right and honorable. We get to choose. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for showing us that your ways are right and that your heart for us is to bless our lives. And God, you have shown us in these verses that the fruit of the Spirit the things that you desire to give to us are good. They're right. They're honorable. They're beautiful. And church, this morning, would you open your heart to God and would you say, this morning, would you say to the Lord, I want, I want the things of the Spirit in my life. God, I don't want to be a flatline Christian. I want to have, the, I want to have some passion I want to have some life. I want to be filled. I want the, the spirit of the living God to be moving in my life. So to the spirit, Lord. So to the spirit.
I open my heart to you. So to the Spirit, I'm asking for revival. I want life. Would you just raise your hand and say that to the Lord? God, please know my heart. Just raise your hand. Say it boldly to the Lord. I, I want you to know my heart, God. I'm asking. So to the Spirit, bring revival, bring life. Father, thank you for everyone. Touched of God, moved of the Spirit. Revival comes. Ignite your church. Bring passion to your church. The bride of Christ is supposed to be in love. Lord, let us be ignited because you have moved by your Spirit upon us. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said.